Well, good evening, everybody. It's Saturday night, Southwest Believers Convention. Here we are. Let's give God praise. Let's give him praise and glory and honor for this time. Glory to God. So thankful that you've been with us. How many of you have been, have been here throughout the entire convention? Look at all the hands. Oh, my goodness. You guys are serious about this, aren't you? Praise God. Well, we welcome all of you, all of you who are here tonight. We're here coming from the Tarrant County Convention Center in Fort Worth. And we have people watching right now from all over the world, from the top of the world to the bottom, all the way around the middle. Welcome to the Believers Convention tonight. Give them a great hand, everyone. Thank you, Lord. I want to mention something to you before we go on in the service. You know, it takes a lot of people to do this convention. A convention just doesn't happen. A team just doesn't come down here on Saturday, set up a little bit. It takes a lot of time, months of preparation. And we have 450 people working at Kenneth Culpa Ministries. And every one of those 450 people touch this convention, have something to do with this convention. So I'd like to just take a moment and just, if you would give a great hand to the Kenneth Culpa Ministry staff, what a marvelous job. What a marvelous job. They truly, they truly carry the spirit of excellence. The spirit of excellence that Brother Copeland has imparted into us, that Gloria Copeland has imparted into us, they carry that spirit of excellence. And I also want to thank all of those who are volunteers, volunteers all over this place. Give our volunteers a great hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, every year, and I'll, I'll mention this to you, and those of you, by the way, that want to start coming up to the altars, we go into our worship and praise and worship time. But every year, what we do is we produce what we call our recap video. And it's a video that just takes little bits and pieces of the whole week, and we put it together. And it really is something to see just a comprehensive picture of what a believer's convention looks like. So I want you to do this. Take a look at your screens. We're going to show this video. And then right out of the video, we are going to praise and worship the Lord. So guys, go ahead and roll that for me if you would, please. Christians are going to start following Jeremiah 29, 7. Demand the welfare of the nation that we are in, because your welfare is tied to your nation's welfare. That is the Lord speaking. But we have to understand what I said at the beginning. There is a political problem that has to change. But there's a spiritual problem that has to be handled first. I, I hope you're getting excited about this because I want you leaving today realizing I'm richer than I knew I was when I came in here. Why? Because I don't care what is or isn't in the bank. If you've got love on display in your life, you are richer than you thought you were. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, come on, everybody, say that loud. Oh, Lord. God of heaven and earth, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God and Father of my Lord Jesus Christ, you are my God, my only God. I thank God for my grandmother who was a prophetess in the prayer closet. I thank God for that because I got news for you. You're standing in here today because that woman of God put her nose in the carpet every single day of her life because she was always looking for Jesus, looking for Jesus. How long has your money been sitting in God's bank waiting for you to receive it, but you would not? How long are you going to wait? Oh, no, Lord. Oh, Lord, that's too much, Lord. Well, you know, oh, I don't want people to think I'm greedy, Lord. And uh, what's the matter with you? <laughs> How long? How long? Jesus came with an assignment to destroy the works of the devil, to redeem us, hallelujah, to make us righteous, to cause us to be blessed and highly favored. And when the time was right and he came and he fulfilled his assignment, Satan had to stand by and watch it happen and couldn't do a thing about it. Remind yourself, wait a minute, God loves me. I know I'm healed. 
Wait a minute, God loves me. I know I'm getting the promotion. Wait a minute, God loves me. I know I'm going to be delivered from this. He loves me. I'm not going to stay captive to this all my life because God loves me and I know it. And so when you know God loves you, your faith begins to work because you believe the love that God has for you. They said, what kind of man is this? Shall I tell you? A faith man. Come on. He did everything by faith because it said he perfectly pleased the Father. Yes, sir. It's impossible to please him without faith. That's right. He did everything by faith in his Father. Yes. Well, bless the Lord. Are you ready? If you walked in sick, you're gonna walk out here. If you walked in bound, you're gonna walk out free. If you walked in hell, you're gonna walk out alive. If you walked in with, it's gonna be alright. Just the mention of his name. you fool. Man, there's no other week like this week that I know of that you can come and just get soaked in the presence in the Word of God. Christ is my firm foundation. Put my faith in Jesus. 
thankful tonight that you're on Christ and you're in Christ and you're standing on the solid rock and you're on the right side could I get every person in the room just to lift up your hands and open up your mouths just for maybe 30 seconds here and just worship just worship we have so much to be thankful for so much to be thankful for Candy, go to the front, if you will. Father, thank you for all that you've done. Thank you, Jesus. The Lord bless you.
first verse. Out of the message translation, it says, if you listen obediently to the voice of God, your God, and heartily obey all his commandments that I command to you today, God, your God, will place you on high high above all nations of the world all these blessings will come down on you and spread out beyond you because you have responded to the voice of God your God blessings made in the city and blessings when you come into the country blessings on your children and the crops of your land your young and your livestock the calves and the lambs of your flocks blessings on your basket and bed and over all of your house and blessings in your coming and blessings in your going may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor may his favor be upon you Lift up your voice and thank God for Brother Kenneth Copeland as he comes to the platform. Glory to God. Praise God. Let's just praise him. Let's just praise and worship. Praise him. Oh, hallelujah. This Southwest Believers Convention 
has broken all ministry records over all of the years we've been in the ministry. If there's a recession around here, we can't tell it. <laughs> oh, hallelujah to, to Jesus. Praise God. Thank you, our Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Blessed Holy Spirit, your presence is among us tonight and has been for six days. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you. Just lift your hands. We praise you. Thank you. We bless you. You're always blessing us. We bless you, our Father. We bless you, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Holy Spirit. And we praise with full hearts faith that has risen to a, a new level, a new high. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, give somebody a big smile and a God love you and shake their hand. Tell them you're glad they're here tonight and then you can be seated. Would you come up here, sweetheart? Hallelujah. Now, I want to ask you something. How many of you this week learned things about prayer that you did not know when you got here? <laughs> and a way of praying and learning that. It's not only amazing, it's a precious thing to know because you can do this. You can do it. And when uh, I learned this from my spiritual father, Oral Roberts, he said, all Christian failure is a prayer failure. That's the reason the first thing they built on the ORU campus was the prayer tower. So, when we came out there to Eagle Mountain, first thing we built was our little prayer chapel, which is doing the same thing. But this one. Now, my mother taught her to pray. And my mother prayed all the time. She did. <laughs> and her first project was me. Terry, we got to pray for your daddy. We got to pray for your daddy. And there were some pictures down her hallway, and one of them is a series of, I guess, publicity pictures yeah. that Dad had made. And one of them was him with the cigarette in his hand doing this, you know, looking, oh, looking all, looking all that. And so <laughs> she'd have me praying for him, and I'd be walking down that hall, put my hand up on his picture. Dad, you got to save Daddy. You got to save Daddy. You got to save Daddy. And uh, he was faithful. <laughs> so it wasn't too long that picture came down. <laughs> <laughs> and then mother went and told Evelyn Roberts, pray for my boy. <laughs> and so, and, and then she told Brother Roberts about that. And so they, they started praying over me. Well, and then I, 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 I had no idea of that when I wound up at ORU. I didn't know she'd been praying for me all that time with Mother and Terry. Amen. Well, I'll tell you what. Thanks, Dad. She's special to me. Oh, I thank Glory you. Glory to God. Thank you. It was an honor. It was an honor to lead the, the prayer. We had great prayer over these meetings. And Jesus, well, it worked. Yep, and <laughs> Jesus is coming. We, yes, just, we decided that, didn't yes, we? Yes, amen. Right. Glory to God. Praise God. I love you, baby. Love you. And I'll tell you what, all the records have been broken. A hundred and twenty-two nations. We've never seen that before. 
when we came into this meeting, 109 is the most we'd ever seen. Now, 377,654 households. That comes up to 1,132,962 people. This morning in healing school, 17,000 were online. This building won't hold 17,000 people, but it did today. And the people were texting in about their healings as fast as Kurt could, could receive them. Folks, we're in a move of God. It's a huge move of God. And anytime you see war devils rising up, anytime you, and anytime you see the, the, the world getting in a war, uh, on a war footing, you just, be, you just know there's a move of God on the way and the devil is doing all he can to dr draw attention away from, from what's happening. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. We are in it. And it's all over the world. Amen. People are crying out to God. And, and there are people saying, oh, what's going to happen to Israel? Uh, well, of course we're supposed to pray. Oh, the United States is going down the drain. No, it isn't. No, first covenants count. And we look in our Bibles and find out what's going to happen to Israel. I pray and I believe God. And I have certain concerns, but I have cast those over on the Lord. And just stay strong. I wrote in the front of my Bible, stay on the God side of everything. Stay on His side. He's on our side. Now then, tonight's offering is a praise offering. And, um, well, I'm going to read these nations. Dear Lord, this is just so exciting. We have added American Samoa, Angola, Antigua, Barbuda, Argentina, Armenia, Aruba, Australia, Austria, Bahamas, Barbados, Belarus, Belgium, Belize, Bermuda, Bolivia, Bonaire is added, Botswana, Brazil, British Virgin Islands, Bulgaria, Cambodia, Canada, Cayman Islands, Chile, China, Colombia, Costa Rica, Cuba, Curacao, Czech Republic, Dem Democratic Republic of Congo, Denmark, Democratic Republic, Ecuador, El Salvador, Equatorial Guinea, Fiji, Finland, France, Germany, Ghana, Greece, Grenada, Guam, Guatemala, Guyana, Haiti has been added. Glory to God. Haiti is among us. <laughs> Honduras, Hong Kong, Iceland, India, Indonesia, Ireland, Israel, Italy, Ivory Coast, Jamaica, Japan, Kazakhstan, Kenya, Kyrgyzstan, Latvia, Lebanon, Luxembourg, Malawi, Malaysia, Malta, Marshall Islands. Glory to God. My, we've preached in the Marshall Islands. Glory to God. I mean, one of the greatest meetings we've ever had in the history of this ministry. I wish I had time to tell you about it. Mauritius, Mexico, Morocco, Myanmar, Nepal, Netherlands, New Zealand, Nicaragua, Nigeria, Norway, Pakistan, Palau, Panama, Papua New Guinea has been added. Paraguay, Peru, Philippines, Poland, Portugal, Puerto Rico, Romania, Russia, Rwanda, St. Kitts and Nevis, St. Lucia, Samoa, Sierra Leone, Singapore, St. Martin, Slovakia, Solomon Islands, South Korea, South, South Africa, South Korea, Spain, Sri Lanka, Sweden, Switzerland, Taiwan, Tanzania, Thailand, Trinidad and Tobago, Turkey, Turks and Caicos Islands, U.S. Virgin Islands, Uganda, Ukraine, United Arab Emirates, United Kingdom, United States, Uruguay, Vanuatu, Venezuela, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. Glory to God. 
That's it. But now, this time next year, I'm going to be standing here, and we're going to have more than that. And Gloria Jean's going to be standing here right next to me reading it. Here, I'll take, I'm going to take that one home. Gloria said, you bring that home to me tonight. I want to see that. <laughs> so I'll take that to her. Now then, open your Bibles with me, please, to the 10th chapter of the book of Mark. Mark chapter 10. And we'll come down to verse 17. When he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and running, ran up here, running and kneeled to him and asked him, good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Now there's the question. So repeat that. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? That was his question. All right. Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Thou knowest the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honor your father and your mother. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. Jesus beholding him loved him and said unto him, one thing you lack. One thing. That's, I mean, that's pretty good. Now, I, I never have come to him and he said, Ken, it's only one thing you lack. I've heard him say, now, Kenneth, you need to do this. And you need to do this. You need to do this. One thing. One thing. Go your way. Sell whatsoever you have. Give to the poor. And you shall have treasure in heaven. Come, take up the cross and follow me. Now, let's look at this a minute. One thing you like. One thing. Go your way. Or you go do this now. Sell whatsoever you have and give to the poor. Thou shalt have treasure in heaven. Come take up the cross and follow me. Mm, mm, mm. And he was sad at that saying, and he went away grieved, for he had great possessions. Jesus looked around about and said to his disciples, how hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God. And the disciples were astonished at his words. Now, poor people wouldn't have been astonished at that. They said, well, you know, that's where them rich cats are. I mean, you know, they need to just dump everything like we have and, and go along and be poor with Jesus. That's what the general Christian public thinks. That couldn't be, that is so far from the truth. Now watch this. They were, and he said, how hard it is, now listen, for them that trust, trust in it. So now we see this young man's problem. Trust in riches 
to enter into the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man who trusts in riches to enter into the kingdom of God. They were astonished out of measure, saying among themselves, Who then can be saved? Jesus, looking upon them, saith, With men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God all things are possible. Now, now then the conversation started. Peter began to say unto him, Lo, we have left all and followed you. In other words, he said, We did that and followed you. Jesus answered him and said, Verily, I say unto you, there is no man or nobody that hath left house or brethren or sisters or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my sake and the gospel. So what he said here, uh, for my sake and for what I preach, that have invested in this ministry, taken everything they had and invested in this ministry, but he shall receive a hundredfold now. Now, it's coming. Now, in this time, houses, brethren, sisters, mothers, children, and lands with persecutions, and in the world to come eternal life. He answered the man. Amen. Amen. So that's all the man asked. Now then, Praise God. I want you to turn with me over into the book of Acts and look in the fourth chapter. Verse 33, with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Neither was there any among them that lacked. For as many were possessors of lands or houses sold them, brought the pieces of things that were sold, laid them down at the apostles' feet, and distribution was made to every man according as he had need. And Joseph, who by the apostles, by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it, brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. That was the young man. That's him. Now, history bears it out, but now think about this now. All of those apostles were there when that man came up there. They saw it all. They knew him by sight. <laughs> and they got over there with him, and they said, now, now I'm going to tell you something. You blew it. You could have been one of us. But we're changing your name. You're now Barnabas. <laughs> well, he started selling land. <laughs> yeah, he said, boy, man, I mean, I really fouled this up before. But there he is. He missed an opportunity to be an apostle of the Lamb because he was a good replacement for Judas. And, and I, I, I seem to have that in my spirit that Jesus is looking at him because Jesus already knew Judas. He, he knew who he was. The scripture says he knew him when he called him. And he's looking at this young man and he's, well, yep, yeah, there's my replacement right there. If you, come on, boy, come on, come on, come on. But no, nah, he backed away. But then, now he's a Levite. 
He's of the priesthood. So he's highly educated in the things of the Word. And the Levites were very wealthy. <laughs> God planned it that way. So now follow his track. He's the one. He's the one that went after Saul of Tarsus. <laughs> and over there in the 13th chapter of the book of Acts, let's turn there, please. There's something very, very important here. And people skim over it. Well, I'm not in the habit of doing that. Now, there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas, <laughs> I mean, he's the number one name now. Barnabas, Simeon, that was called Niger, they pointed out the fact that he's black. This is very important here. The, the Bible makes a point of this. And Lucius of Cyrene, Manon, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. He still saw. They ministered to the Lord and fasted. The Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands upon them, they sent them away. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia and from there sailed to Cyprus. Now come down to verse 9. Then, uh, then Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes. Glory to God. Does these things excite you? Yes. <laughs> yes. I mean, do your homework. Yes. And, 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 and pray and seek the Lord and say, Lord, open my eyes here. Let me see, let me see what's going on here. It's what I call going widescreen. So go back through the scriptures and everywhere you see Capernaum, right home out beside it. That's where Jesus lived. Well, one night, it was, it was, oh, I mean, he had been going and they'd been, they'd, you know, and all that. And, 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 and so, I, I mean, and they saw him walking on the water. Well, it scared everybody but Peter. He said, that's you, Lord, bid me come. Well, what's the Lord going to say? It's not me. <laughs> so he said, come on. Well, anyway. Jesus got in the boat and immediately it was in Capernaum. Well, I'd read that over and over and over again. I stopped there when I said, Lord, let me look at that. What'd you do there? What did you do there? And I started praying in the spirit and, and, and on the inside of me, he said, Kenneth, my men were tired. He said, now you're a traveling preacher. You know what it's like to get home and sleep in your own bed. And he said, enough of this rowing, let's get back. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Well, he hadn't changed. Now, let's go back over there now where we were in, in Mark 10. Because I, I want us to look at that, put our eyes on it one more time. But he shall receive a hundredfold. Read it out loud with me. But I shall receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses, brethren, sisters, mothers, children, lands with persecutions, and in the world to come eternal life. Well, the persecution is coming because he already warned us of that. 
Satan comes immediately to try to steal it, but he's been defeated. He can't get it done if you won't let him. He can't get it done if you don't let him. Amen. And Father, we receive and thank you for this praise offering tonight in the name of Jesus. Southwest Believers Convention, budget amount, $1,707,082. Offering received, $3,679,080. We are $1,971,998 over the budget. Tonight, we'll go two million over the budget. Hey, and Jesus just said you have a hundredfold coming. You better claim it. Somebody got in my face and said, well, yeah, you that name it, claim it, blab it, grab it bunch. I said, yes, bless God, we are. Really? Yeah, we named it, claimed it, grabbed it, and blabbed it, and we grabbed, we've, and we've got it, hallelujah. And it's still coming in, and it's still being blessed, and we're still moving on with God. I'll tell you, the devil is a nightmare, but I'll tell you, his, his, the worst thing he can think of is Christian people with money enough to do what God tells them to do, especially preachers. Yes, amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, there, there was, they called me one day out there at the airport, and they said, there's a guy out here that's landed out here, and we don't know him. But he's, he's having a little problem with his airplane. Maybe you need to come down. Well, he's, he's flying a single engine airplane. Got down there, <clears throat> and he said, Brother Copeland, he said, uh, 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 this, th this engine is, it, it really needs overhauling. And it's, you know, it's trouble. But he said, he said, I'm in the mission for you. This thing is giving me trouble. And he said, I just landed here. But he said, I didn't know this was your place. So uh, we sat down. And, and, and the mechanic came out there and looked at what he had. We went back inside and, and we got acquainted and got his name and address and, and everything, praise God. So the ministry just overhauled that engine for him. Don't give him new spark plugs, overhaul his engine. Now, here's one of the main things. Name the seed. Name it. Amen. Write it down. Write these things down. If you're going on a, on a different food plan on, under God's direction, write it down. And that devil starts coming at you and take the scriptures and write in there and keep it, keep it in your notebook or keep it in your Bible. And the devil starts after you and you just say, uh, devil, it is written, and, and I wrote this down at such and such date, and here's the scripture I'm standing on, and I said right here, this is what I eat, and I don't eat anything else. Now get behind me, Satan. It is written. I said it's written. <laughs> Well, the, it, there's nothing in the book says you can't write it. You take what is written. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away. My words will never pass away. Everything he says said is written down in heaven's archives. And when there is a new heaven and a new earth, this law book will still be there. Amen. It's still here. And any angel in the future that has any idea of doing, there'll be a hook put in his jaw. Why? Because the law has been fulfilled. 
The covenants have been fulfilled. The blood has been spilled. There will never be, there will never be any more glorified ones. Amen. We're it. I mean, when that trumpet blows, that's it. <laughs> Glory to God. Now, after Jesus' resurrection, he stayed around for six weeks. And there, the graves were open, and there were people raised up after his resurrection. He's the pattern. I'm totally convinced, Billy, that after the resurrection, we're going to be here about six weeks. Uh, <laughs> It doesn't say we go up in a twinkling in the eye. It says we'll be changed in a twinkling of an eye. So it could wear mail me. You won't be able to see us. <laughs> but wouldn't it be something if grandma comes out of the grave and, and walks in on grandson one night and he says, you doing here? She said, you know what I've been telling you? Get on your knees right now, boy. <laughs> I don't know. This is this, you know, I mean, this is um, first Kenneth chapter one, but, <laughs> but it, it seems to me since he is the pattern for it to be that way. Amen. Amen. All right. Kurt, come on, son. Well, praise the Lord. If you'd like an offering envelope here. I think I'm going to frame this. <laughs> it's pretty good stuff. <laughs> praise God. If you'd like an offering envelope here in the sanctuary, uh, just raise your hand. And you just heard Brother Copeland say, write it down. And we've said this over the last couple sessions. Whatever you are believing God for, write it down. Maybe you put an offering in every session and you're writing it down. Continue to write it down. And we're going to keep praying over you and over that offering and speak blessings over that. Amen. Come on. I said, we're going to pray over that and speak blessings over you. Amen. And so, so many of you have heard this message over and over these last six days. But if, have you sown into the offering? Have you sown into this good soil? And we want to encourage you this evening. So many of you have come in for the first time tonight to Southwest. Welcome. We're so glad that you came. For the thousands of you that are watching and have been watching this entire week, we appreciate your giving so much. So many of you have been watching on our website. You can give online, kcm.org forward slash TV event. And also, you can text to give. Many of you have done that here in the sanctuary. Many of you have done it at home or your office, wherever you're watching watching around the world, simply text EVENT to 36609 and the dollar amount. Also for Facebook, welcome Facebook family. Thank you so much for joining us on GoVictory.com or on the KCM page. Right in the bottom right-hand corner, there's a link. Just simply click that link and it'll take you to a secure page. And of course, our licensed prayer ministers are there to take your phone call. Maybe today during healing school, uh, you needed someone to pray with you and you weren't able to get through. We want to encourage you tonight. Maybe you still need that prayer. We want to encourage you to call that number, 877-281-6297. And of course, you can stick your offering in the mail. Simply address it to Kenneth Copeland Ministries or KCM, Fort Worth, Texas, 76192. And if you're right now to check, simply put KCM or Kenneth Copeland Ministries on your check as you place it in the offering envelope here this evening. It's been a joy and an honor to serve you. We've met so many of you out in the, the Victory Central area. Thank you for coming to Southwest. You want to make a note. And for those of you that are watching, so many of you put in the chat that you're going to come next year. Southwest 2023 is July 31st through August the 5th, right back here at the Fort Worth Convention Center. And we hope to see all of you back here and the thousands of you that are watching all over the world. We'd love to see you here in Fort Worth, Texas. God bless. There's a holy expectation And it's rising in the room With great anticipation 
the glory of the Lord. Here comes the glory of the Lord, sweeping in the room. There's a holy expectation, and it's right. the glory of the Lord. Oh, here comes 
you please? Have they not done a wonderful job this week? Oh, Whew, hallelujah. Hey, David, you know, you know what I see coming in this over the, over the budget? We're going to see a new grand piano sitting right here. Yes. <laughs> yes, we are. Yes, we are. Mm -hmm. And it, you did that. Yeah. You did that. Glory to God. Well, be seated. I'm going I'm to come on down there and talk to you for a little bit. And um, <laughs> oh, I'll tell you, Southwest Believers Convention 2022, churches supplying supportive ministry. Of course, Eagle Mountain International Church, Fort Worth, George and Terry Pearson's pastor. Gateway Church, South Lake, Texas, pastors Robert and Debbie Morris. Good friends. Oh, I tell you. You know where I met him? Well, I met him the first time was with James Robinson. But that was just for a few moments. Do you remember when Mr. Trump had a state dinner for evangelical yes. preachers? Yes. That's where I met him. <laughs> no president has ever done that in the history of the United States. Wow. Honored us. And he got up there. We were in the White House, in the, in, in the, you know, the main room there. And uh, he said, well, now just get up here and just say whatever's on your heart. And everybody laughed. He said, well, I don't mean for all long that much time now. <laughs> it was, that place was so anointed that night. It just blessed that whole place. Hallelujah. Mm. And Heritage of Faith Christian Center, Crowley, Texas, Justin and Annette Bridges, and uh, Rallies for Christ, Ontario, uh, Ontario, California, Rick and Nettie Raina. Rick and Nettie, are you there? They, yeah, glory to God. Bless your sweetheart. And uh, now Rick is the one that I did the rally movies with. And uh, we had a lot of fun with that. And, uh, and then Metroplex Family Church, Fort Worth, Texas, pastors Brian Jacobs. Gene Sanders, coordinator, Eagle Mountain International Church for Deaf Interpretation, Fort Worth, Texas. I tell you, I'm, I'm, I'm blessed beyond measure tonight. My heart is, is full. And back in the day, and Gloria and I were there in Tulsa, Julie London had a song out. Our day will come when we'll have everything so I just started singing that. I said, come on, girl. Our day will come. Our day came. <laughs> and Jesus did it. Yes, he did, because Oral Roberts taught us how to sow financially. He taught us. And he taught us prayer, the essentials of prayer, that prayer well, like he said, Christian failure is a prayer failure. Yes, it is. One day he said to me, he said, Kenneth, I have never made a mistake. I said, is that right? He said, yes. He was serious. He said, I never got up one morning and said, I'm going to make a mistake today. He said, there's a lot of them turned out to be like that. But he said, if you'll pray and let God teach you wh what caused you to make that mistake, what caused you to make that error, yeah. he said, he said, the persecution, that comes from finances. We just read it tonight. He said, persecution, if it doesn't kill you, it'll make you strong. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, the more you gain financially, well, you're a threat to the devil then. And people, I was in a, in a parking lot one day, I was driving my pickup around it in, in, in a parking lot in a uh, uh, shopping area. And uh, 
I was driving out and I just got in my truck and was headed around. And this fellow said, Brother Copeland, Brother Copeland. Ran up there with a big smile on his face. I rolled the window down. And he gave me a good piece of information. He said, now, Brother Copeland, I want to tell you something. He only promised to meet our needs, not our wants. I said, is that right? That's right. I said, well, you know, I guess it was messed up. I just went ahead and believed the 23rd Psalm, the Lord's my shepherd, I do not want. I said, but he promised to meet my needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. And he's given us all things richly to enjoy. He said, I'll see you around, Brother Copeland. (laughs) But that's the general idea. And it's generally wrong. Hallelujah. Father, thank you tonight. What a privilege it is to stand behind this desk again tonight. We praise you and thank you and worship you. Yes, you are El Shaddai, the God who's more than enough. (laughs) Thank you, Father. We thank you and praise you tonight for a week well done. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. So let's go back to the fourth chapter of the book of Mark. And then I I want to go to uh, the fifth chapter of Mark. Now, we began with the truth that words are spiritual containers. Jesus said that in John 6, 63. He said, my words are spirit and they are life. They are life words. So say this, I am a believer. I am am not a doubter. My faith is strong. My My words are healing words. I rejoice at the sound of the truth. And I walk in love. I walk by faith. I I fight the good fight of faith. faith. And it's a good fight fight. because the victory is already won. My words are full of victory. victory. I'm a victorious believer. I have a voice. voice. My voice is the voice of victory. And this is the victory victory. that overcomes the world, world. even my faith. faith. Who is he that overcomes the world? The The one who believes Jesus is the Christ raised from the dead. Shout it out. Glory to God. I have the victory. Ah, the sower sows the Word. Now, we began that Monday morning and, uh, and talked about what Jesus said. And the first thing he said, he said, hearken and behold. Listen, why did he say that? I'm about to say something. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I used to tell the kids, I said, all right, Are you listening? Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. I said, get your catchers out. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) You listen to me. Amen. Amen. (laughs) As a family, we had a lot of fun. But now we had rules in our house that your mother and I are a solid front so don't come in here telling me, well, well, you know, mother said this. If you're going to come on with that, we're going to go in there and talk to mother. Well, no, no. <laughs> we 
never did tell them, I'm going to spank you if you do that again. And they did it again. The spanking came. Well, I'll, yeah, but the next time you, well, no, it's all over. Amen. Our words had authority Amen. and love. I told John, just, just, just a little guy, and I could see right off that he liked knives. Well, he came by, honestly, I have a whole collection. I got a whole drawer full of knives I mean, and hunting knives and knives that people have given me and a whole set of Harley Davidson knives. And, and, and he just, just if, it had, if it was a knife, he wanted it. So now my words. And I had a drawer there in the kitchen and it had some knives in there. So I took him in there. I said, now, John, I'm going to tell you something about these knives. They'll hurt you. I said, don't play with them without me. Do you hear me? Uh-huh. I said, all right, tell me. Do you, you, you don't play with these without me. No, I know. Well, I went on in the other room <laughs> And a little bit, ah! I went in there. And he picked up one of the little small knives and he, he got it open and he tried to close it and he closed it on his thumb. So his thumb was in there. And he's when I said, don't try to squeeze it. I said, you'll cut it more. Oh, he's just going. So I got hold of it, peeled it up there like that. And I... I cleaned it, cleaned the wound and, and covered it. It wasn't all that bad. And I put it on there. I said, uh, that kind of hurt, didn't it? Yes, sir, it did. <laughs> I said, do you happen to remember what I told you just a little while ago? <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> I said, all right. Now, it was one of those little knives that that uh, had one little knife on one side, one on this side, little old blade about that long. I said, all right. I reached in there and picked it up and cleaned it off. I said, now look at this. You take this and when you open it, open it all the way like that. And you get ready to close it, hold it down here and take your hand and do this. And don't ever get do this. So when his thumb healed up, I just went in there and he got it. And I said, now you do it. Well, he looked at it a little bit. He didn't know whether he wanted to. I said, do it. It's not going to hurt you if you do it the right way. So he did it the right way. There was no reason in the world for me to jump all over him. I told you, bless God, not to do that. Now you will learn not to do it. Well, he already learned not to do that. <laughs> Why? Because God has never done me that way. Now, there's something about my dad. He said, Kenna, I told you not to do that. Yes, sir. You did it anyway. I said, yes, I did. Well, I'm going to spank you for it. And he's going about it. Well, when? <laughs> I'm going to spank you for it. Yeah. It's coming. <laughs> now, mother would go along. If she waited very long, she'd back out. <laughs> But she's an instant spanker. <laughs> She'd grab a switch, just work me over good. <laughs> My dad said, I'm going to spank you for it. He might go on, on the road for a week and come back. I never knew when it was coming. I want you to know it was absolute torture. Because I mean, when he spanked, he didn't spank me but two or three times in my life. But, oh, honey, babe. <laughs> 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 
You know, the Word says, spare the rod and spoil the child. Well, I was not spoiled. <laughs> I really was, but I hid it real well. <laughs> well, I mean, when the time come, he said, well, I told you, come on. And we either go out in the garage or go back in his bedroom and he'd shut the door. And, he, and, and he'd tell me, you know better. Now, I'm your dad, and I'm your friend, but I'm also the one that disciplines you. And I remembered it for <laughs> days. I'd go to school and sit down and say, what's the matter? Ain't none of your business. <laughs> Oh, ah. well, I don't believe he should have done that. Well, I believe he should. Kelly's son, Max, was having some problems, and he, he, he was upset with himself. And he, he, was, he was having, having he, didn't, he didn't like what he was doing. And he came home from school. Now, Kelly would use a wooden spoon. And he went and got the spoon and read the scripture and said, here. <laughs> and he didn't do it anymore. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, in this, we noticed that the Word does its part. Look at the 15th verse. These are they by the wayside where the Word is sown. When they have heard, Satan comes immediately and taketh away the Word that was sown in their hearts. They heard the Word. These are they likewise which are sown on stony ground. When they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness. The word was doing what it was supposed to do. It's what the people did or did not do that made the difference. It's how much they listened, how much they retained what they heard. Then I talked to you about the fact that Gloria and I went to the Word to get out of debt. But we found more scriptures than Romans 13, 8. You can't do that. He wasn't even talking about money there. But that's what got our attention. So we let these words go down in us. And Gloria said, we're going to have to do soil sample here. We're going to have to be this hundredfold group. This hundredfold group. We have to be in order to do what the Lord's told us to do. I say, that's right, our day will come. <laughs> and it did. But now, just, just follow this all the way down. These are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust or pressures of other things. Look up the word lust. It is a drive and a crave to do things that are forbidden. I heard Oral Roberts say this. A person came up to him and said, and, and I'm, t I'm talking about a, a, a nice man now. He's not belligerent or anything. But he said, now, now God made me a homosexual. I didn't know how he was going to answer that. And oil was just as kind. He said, no, sir. God has never made anybody something he has forbidden. And you could see that it registered on his face and in his eyes. Amen. So, it, you, you, this, this, this is the way you have to look at sin. 
Now, if I had time, we would read the Ten Commandments. When, and just don't stop reading at the Ten Commandments. Keep reading because he begins to talk about the blessing. Amen. Amen. So, so here's the way the Lord read it to me. Uh, you shall have no other gods before me. And, and he said, Kenneth, you don't need another God. I'm the best. Amen. He said, whatever second place, not going to make it, bud. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And he said, don't covet another the man's wife. He said, don't be doing that. He said, didn't I do you well? And I had no idea Glory Jean was even in the world. <laughs> Glory to God. Hallelujah. The blessings are involved. That's what those commandments are about. They're not do's and don'ts, they're blessings. Yes. That's the truth. Hallelujah. Thank you, Billy. <laughs> now, hang on. Okay, Lord. Um, thank you, Lord Jesus. Let's see, right? Isaiah 55, 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain comes down and snow from heaven and returns not there but waters the earth and makes it bring forth uh, bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. Amen. It'll not return to me void. Well, how does it return? You take his word and pray it back at him. I was praying one day and I'm just really having a good time at it. And the word of the Lord came to me and he said, let the word fight its own fight. Amen. Whoa. <laughs> let the word fight its own fight. Amen. For you see, saith the Lord, my word is referred to as a sword, but it is a, a double edged sword. It is sharp and sharp and sharp, and it'll cut and it'll do things. And it, the, if you put my word in your mouth and then you bring it back to me, then I'm obligated to listen. So come before me with my word in your mouth and plead your case. Amen. Plead your case. I want to hear it. I'll plead my case. Yes. <laughs> Let my word do the fight. Amen. You just hold the handle of the sword. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Well, you suit up with the full armor of God and then you find out it's prayer armor. <laughs> there was a woman I'd, I'd been praying for. She, I was ministering to her over the phone. <laughs> she said, well, now, Brother Copeland, I'm telling you, now, Mama is, Mama's sick. And, and I said, hey, now, wait, wait, whoa, wait a minute. What? I thought you had a covenant with God. I do. I said, you don't sound like it. Well, I do have a covenant with God. I said, well, what does it say? Uh, well, 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 I'll tell you what it says. And she just started coming at me with that. She said, and the, 
the, more, the louder she got, the more excited she got. And I'll tell you, bless God, I have a covenant. God, I'm going to go tell her to just get up and get well. <laughs> so, and it went on along there for several days. She called me back. Brother Copeland, I said, now just hold it. I thought you told me you had a covenant. Yeah, I do have a covenant here. She came again. Amen. <laughs> well, it didn't take all that long till it stuck. Now there's another woman that I had ministered to her and she was healed of cancer. Well, it came back on her, so she called me. And, and I said, all right, now I'll tell you what. Now I want you to get your Bible and read, read this together. And I could hear her. She held her hand. She asked somebody, else, where's my Bible? So I just sat there on the phone a little bit. I said, did you find it? Uh, I said, you already know what's the matter. You have put your Bible down. I said, that cancer's working 24 hours a day and the Word isn't. 10% Word, 10% results. Let the Word fight its own fight. These words are spiritual containers. I dare say your faith is higher tonight than it's been in your life. Mine is. I needed this meeting. Glory to God. I mean, you know, and as you notice, I mean, we had direct uh, into the rooms and, and I, I just go back to my room and just get in on all the rest of it. Now, one year, the, the year that we sold that first little house in Steamboat Springs, we had a gold wing up there that was in a storage uh, place. And after Southwest, I went up there to get it. Well, now back there then, if I was not in the meetings, there was no way to hear. So I just get the tapes and listen to it later. Well, I was tired, and it was hot. <laughs> you know, August, I mean, it's just over. So I told Gloria, uh, I said, I I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to Steamboat and get that motorcycle. So the guys flew me up there, and, and I went over and, and got it. Well, and I had the trailer, and I had all that hooked up. Well, on front of that trailer, I had a cooler. So I filled it full of ice and water. Now the first night I stayed on the mountainside of it as long as I could and got down to Trinidad and then I left there and went to Clayton, New Mexico. And I got up Clayton, New Mexico at 4.20 in the morning to get through Amarillo before it's hot. <laughs> I'm listening to those tapes. That, that gold wing had a tape player in the side of it, cassette deck. So I'm listening to everybody's tapes. Man. And it, the, I mean, the further south I got, the hotter it got. <laughs> I rode into Wichita Falls and uh, went in and had lunch, came out and turned my bike on, turned the temperature gauge on. She's 105. Well, you've been here. You know what it's like in Texas this time of year. People gripe about it, but it's supposed to do that. There are years that are better than others. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So I put on a stretch belt. Now, words are containers now, you see. I was tired. And back there in those days, you know, I, I, didn't, have, I didn't take a, a day off. Doing that. I just preached all the way through. <clears throat> And I'd take a stretch belt and I'd stick that bottle of water down in there. And I'd put my towel in that ice water and pull it up around behind my neck and put another tape in. Well, I got home about four o'clock that afternoon, drove in the driveway. I walked out there and Gloria thought I'd just be just bush to have, you know, ride two full days like that straight through. I mean, just stop and eat and everything. And I got off that bike and I said, Gloria, Jean, I want you to know, bless God, if I had time, I'd go back. 
She said, what happened? I said, I listened to 15 tapes. That's what happened. I got home in better shape than when I left. Whoa, man, I'm hearing all this faith. I was, yeah, glory. I needed it. I poured my faith out in that meeting. I needed to hear it. And I listened this time. I sit there and laughed at Jeremy and Keith and, and Jesse. I don't you know. What did Jesse say? Tell me what he said. You don't even know. <laughs> the whole thing is so exciting. You know what's exciting about it? You. You. Hungry people. That's what makes it powerful. And that's what makes it good. Now, let's go back over there once more where we were in Mark 4. Now, continue with it. Look, look here in 21. He said unto them, Is a candle brought to be put under a bushel or under a bed? What good is a candle under a bed? It's worthless. May set the bed on fire, but the <laughs> glory's little brother, Stanley. We, we were there at, at Pop's house, and we smelled smoke. And, uh, and the mattress was on fire up underneath the bed. Stanley, I mean, that's the first thing. Stanley, come in here. He came in there. He said, did you set that bed on fire? No. <laughs> you sure? Uh-uh. He said, who did? He said, a rabbit did it. <laughs> <laughs> Charles Capps said there's a little boy in Sunday school. And the teacher said, what is a lie? He said, it's an abomination to God and ever-present help in the time of need. <laughs> then she's teaching on, and she said, Lot's wife looked back and turned into a pillar of salt. And he spoke up and said, that ain't nothing. My mother looked back and turned into a telephone pole. <laughs> <laughs> well, what'd that have to do with this lesson? Absolutely nothing, but I... <laughs> But you can tell this is about the end of the day. <laughs> now notice, there is nothing hidden which shall not be manifested, neither was anything kept secret, but that it should come abroad. Now what does that mean? You can't hide it. Neither can I. Oh, I was having trouble with the TV bill. And, and so, hold your place there and let's go back to the book of Isaiah, chapter 1. <clears throat> 17, learn to do well, seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Well, that's good news, isn't it? Though they be red like crimson, they'll be as wool. If you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. And, uh, <clears throat> and I went before, I took, it, I took that very scripture before him. I said, now, if you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. And we're behind on these television bills. And you said, would well, you said that? He said, you don't qualify for that. I don't. No. He said, you haven't had anything good to say about daily television ever since I told you to do it in, in the beginning. Well, he's right. So he took me over to the curse and he changed my life forever. Now,
And I was reading this, and when he didn't write at that moment, I accepted his correction. By then, I, and I thought, well, I'm, I'm going to change. I'm, I'm willing. Oh, oh, all these curses will come on you and pursue you and overtake you till you be destroyed because you serve not the Lord God with joyfulness and gladness of heart for the abundance of all things. I'm telling you, I'm changed. So now I went to Exodus 23. I wanted to do this this morning, but it, <clears throat> this is misquoted. Verse 25, you shall serve the Lord your God and he shall bless your bread and water and I'll take sickness away from the midst of you. Nothing shall be cast before the young or barren in the day of the land. The number of your days I'll fulfill. Glory to God. That's not what that says. You know why? Because you started there. Go back to the 20th verse. Behold, I send an angel before you to keep you in the way to bring you into the place where I have prepared. And you shall serve the Lord your God, and he, your angel, shall bless your bread and water. I will take sickness from the midst of you. Just a little adjustment. So I started, I started writing that in. You shall serve, I said there, you shall serve the Lord your God with joyfulness and gladness of heart for the abundance of all things. I wrote it there in my Bible. And I got happy. So I, I just started saying, I said, thank you, Lord Jesus. I love daily television. I mean, I love it. Hallelujah. Oh, let me get in on that daily television. Yes, glory be to God. I love it. Hallelujah. Couldn't wait for the next one. So, I, and I was in there by myself. So I don't know, some of you may remember it. I was by myself. And so used to, I wouldn't smile till they turned on the camera. I was tired. I didn't want to do it in the first place. And I told God I didn't want to do it, but I'd do it anyway. And I was, I was so tired and exhausted, but that was my fault. And I sat in there and I looked in that camera one day and I said, I quit. I didn't intend to come back. Gloria Jean said, I'll do it. Now, what you don't know about her, she was so shy and so timid. We were in a church one time. I was preaching there, and the pastor said, Sister Gloria, uh, when we get out, you can just stand and, and greet the people. She said, I don't do that. She meant it. So she was sitting down there with the pastor's wife and he introduced me and he said, Sister Gloria, would you stand and greet the people? She stood up and said, I told you I don't do that. And then she felt like a dog. <laughs> and later she had to apologize. She just didn't do that. And we would have, of course, all my flying buddies would come over and we'd all talk. She'd sit there all night and never say anything. I said, sweetheart, how come you know? She said, why, you talk enough for both of us. But, and I did. She didn't like to do that. Now, she was born the 12th of February, 1942. Her dad was overseas, 1st Infantry Division. Now, he was on ship, the Big Red One. He was on ship headed to Italy. He had an abscessed tooth. They took him off. The, the first infantry division liked it got wiped out. So then he was, he would, when he got this tooth fixed, they put him back aboard ship and he shipped out to England. He trained there in England made it all the way through Normandy, made it all the way through and through the Battle of the Bulls. Now, Olin Creech was in the 1st Infantry Division. He may have known Wallace Neese, Babe Neese. He went all the way through all of that before he got home. He saw things people ought not see. He got home and he had PTSD, something terrible. 
and he would just go along fine and, and he'd get the best of him and, and he'd start drinking and just kind of ch chill out and, and he'd, be, he'd be just out for several days and get up and take care of his job. Well, nobody knew anything about that back there then. Had I known that, I ministered to him anyway. Great guy. I love him so. Well, now he and Mary divorced. It just got to where it, she just, well, she couldn't stay there. But he remarried. And he married a woman that went to the First Baptist Church in Nashville, Arkansas. Well, at first he wouldn't go. Wasn't a bit shame. Ah, uh, but then he had this big bad heart attack. Uh, like to died. Did a bypass. Well, of course, Gloria and I went to Texarkana. I met the, first, the pastor of the First Baptist Church. Amen. And he stayed with him night and day. He stayed with him in that room. He stayed there with him and prayed with him and laid hands on him. And, and he stayed up. And, and then he said, and he, and he said, and then when I got his attention, he said, I led him to Jesus Christ and prayed the prayer of faith with him. He never took another drink. Glory to God. Hallelujah. <laughs> finished up his time, delivered from that war. God is a faithful yes. God. He's a faithful God. Yes, God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. His words changed. He was ministered to by, by a pastor that loved him. <sighs> Lord, my God. Hallelujah. So now, let's go now to the 26th verse. He said, so is the kingdom of God. So this is the way it is. This is the way the kingdom of God is. As if a man should cast seed into the ground. He's already said the sower sows the word. So he's talking about the words of God. He's talking about his own words here. So is the kingdom of God as if a man should cast seed into the ground. Now you put in that offering, you've been sowing in offerings all week long, a lot of it. And those of you that have been online and 36609 and so forth, just like I did. But now, 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 you, now you got the seed in the ground. It's in there. Don't forget about it. Should sleep and rise night and day the seed should spring and grow up. He knows not how. He doesn't need to know. He doesn't need to be a biologist <laughs> for a seed to grow. <coughs> now, Rachel, my granddaughter, Kelly's daughter, oldest, and uh, she and Caleb and the, and the kids live just right there close to us. Well, uh, we were, we were having, uh, you know, it was Halloween for everybody else, but it, we have hallelujah parties. And they were making a hallelujah uh, jack-o'-lantern pumpkin. And it was a smiley face one. And you, you know, you had to, she had a, some big old pumpkins. And so she hollowed them all out and cooked. And then, you know, you stick it where you stick a little candle down on the inside. And the kids thought that was just about the coolest thing they ever saw in their life. <laughs> and so they just went on. She's forgot about it. They were out in the backyard on the picnic table. All of a sudden, some started growing under that table. It was a pumpkin vine. <laughs> Well, of course it was. That, that seed knew what to do. Just give me some ground. I'm going to make a pumpkin. 
Amen. Amen. Now, World War II, we lived in Abilene and, and, the, and the, the ground there just really grow nearly anything. We had victory gardens. And they did this in the big cities. New York City, Chicago, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, people that lived in the cities and had planters. They got rid of the flowers and everything and, and they grow vegetables because the produce was going into the service. Amen. Well, we had a victory garden in our backyard. I'm like a rabbit where carrots are concerned. And well, that, and you go, the government, in some cases, they'd give you the seed. And if you had to buy it, it just was a little nothing. But they were promoting these victory gardens and people were doing that all over the United States. And you had a little package and it had a little stick. And it had a picture of what that seed is. Yes. Well, now before, if you got your flower, your, your flower seeds, they were that way. But you weren't getting that anymore. You're going to have carrots and and whatever else in your victory garden. Well, my mother's raised on a farm and so was my dad. And we had a victory garden out there in our backyard. Oh, it was nice. And mother would say, let the carrots alone until they get, <laughs> and, and then when it came time to pull them, well, I'd, they'd get ready and pull those big old carrots out of the ground. And I'd just go over there and stick it under the hydrant, just get dirt and all. Just to see, say, Kenneth, what? And I said, no, no. <laughs> I'm still that way about carrots. <laughs> Amen. So what? That seed knew what to do. So we had watermelon one day. My dad and I, I mean, to get to travel with him was, uh, I was his disciple. <laughs> he disciplined me. And later <laughs> I became his disciple and he's my hero. Yes, yes. And with it, they'd be selling watermelon on a truck out there somewhere. He'd just stop and get one, go get under a bridge somewhere. He'd clean his pocket knife off and away we go after that watermelon. <laughs> So we had watermelon there one day. Well, I planted the seeds. And I start to leave them and that little vine started coming up. It was right out there behind the back door. And, and that, that little vine started coming up. And finally I looked under there and I got a watermelon about this big. And then it got a little bigger than that and got a little bigger than that. And every time, every day I'd come home from school, I'd, I'd raise that vine up and check. Well, I came home from school one day and I raised up that vine. There's watermelon under there about that big. I thought, we've had a miracle here. <laughs> yes. I said, look at this. And, and my daddy got so excited about it. Man, he cut the stem on that thing and we brought it out there and got on the table and cut it open. I said, there's something wrong here. He said, what's wrong, Kenna? I said, this is red. He said, what's wrong with that? I said, those seeds were yellow. <laughs> I said, you did that, didn't you? He said, yes, I did. <laughs> you can't fool that seed. See, that seed knew exactly what to do and so did the ground. Amen. What did I do? Went to bed and got up, went to bed and got up, went to bed and got up. It grew. I didn't know how, didn't know God, didn't care. I, but I knew it would. This is the point. I knew that it would. I knew that it would. At least I was that smart. I knew that it would work. My grandfather's a farmer and a good one. Good one. I was just a kid and it's hot. Most of the work is at harvest time, but that's when it's fun. It's when you're preparing the boy and the ground is so hot and I was out there in the middle and we, first we were doing is you take a a field hole that has a little bit longer handle. And, and my grandfather, it didn't, have, it didn't have a deep end on it like this. It had like this and sharpen it where you could just scoop that thing under, under stickers and weeds and just slice them off at the ground. But hot and my, my, <laughs> my boots get so hot, I'd curl my toes up. And so, and there, there was a, 
there was a Hispanic guy that, that lived close by there and he'd work for my grandfather from time to time and he was out there. <laughs> and we're going down those rows and I mean, listen, big farm. And you, you know, you, if you're walking down this way, you're walking there and just swinging that hole like that. Well, he's walking and I mean, he's going. He's just going like this and just, I mean, doesn't miss a weed. Well, and, and, and the Spanish guy and me, I mean, we're cutting and slinging as fast as we can. And all of a sudden here come a grandfather going this way and we hadn't got down to the end of the road. And he said, when does that old man fall down? <laughs> I said, he doesn't. That's the problem with this thing. I said, Papa, how come you're so much faster than I am? How come you can do such a better job than this? He looked at me. He said, you don't set your jaw. Oh, what does that mean? <laughs> I didn't mean it. I was just out there because my mama told me to go out there. He was out there because he was in business. He set his jaw. He didn't have anything on his mind but getting every last weed out of that place because he's about to come by, back by through there with either a cotton crop or wheat. And he had three sections of land and one section is 640 acres. He was a busy man, but his rows, I mean, they look like somebody put a rule on them. He said, you can tell a man's character by the way his rows look. He said, they all like this. He don't care. <laughs> but I learned later he's right. And I learned to set my jaw. Amen. Amen. When I found out what I was called to do, and I did it with all of my heart. I realized I had my jaw set. And I remember him. Now, we go in this. The Word is the power because it's the Word of the living God. Whereunto shall we liken the kingdom of God? How we compare it? Like a grain of mustard seed, which when it is sown in the earth is less than all the seeds that be in the earth. But when it's thrown, it grows up and becomes greater than all the herbs and shoots out great branches so that the fowls of the air may lodge under it. And many such parables spake he, now wait, now listen to it. Many such parables spake he the word unto them as they were able to hear it. You notice, notice how many times here was in this. And when they were alone, he expounded all things to his disciples. All things. I mean, he taught them on this. He, he evidently, he got them by themselves, got out of that crowd. I mean, he must have gone over this a whole lot. I think, now you don't hear me say I think a lot, but I'm convinced that that's when he taught them about agreement prayer. Because over in the book of Matthew, he said, again, I say unto you, if any two of you on earth shall agree. Well, when he's expounding all things, so those are the times when he got into those things. Now, now here's what I want you to see out of this, and here's what the Lord wants you to see. The same day, say the same day. Amen. When evening was come, he said to them, let's pass over unto the other side. And when they sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind and the waves beat into the ship. So now it's full. He was in the hinder part of the ship asleep on a pillow. He's been teaching all day. They woke him up and said, Master, carest thou not that we perish? 
He arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace be still. The wind ceased and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? They feared exceedingly and said to one another, What manner of man is this? Even the wind and the sea will be. I'll tell you what was the matter with them. They quit listening. He expounded the whole thing. He went to sleep expecting them to take him home. And the devil stirred up a big wind out there and they got scared. Instead of taking what he taught and saying, he gave us the command to go to the other side. Now we are going and in the night, I'm not going to wake him up. In his name, I'm telling you, storm to get out of here. It would have ceased for them the same as him, but they were not listening well enough to keep it. The devil stole it after all. And there you have the bottom line of that. Now, let's go to the fifth chapter. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Now here, we just found out they came over onto the other side of the sea and in the country of the Gadarenes. Now, if you, if you look at the Galilee, Capernaum is over here. Magdal is down here. And, and the Gadarenes is over here on this side of the lake in this, this part. It's over across the lake from Capernaum. So now, they came out of the ship immediately. They met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. Now, we won't turn there. But in, in fact, we could put it up, the sixth chapter of Ephesians, please, and start with the 10th verse. Thank you, Jesus. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places. Rulers of the darkness of this world are the ones that possess people. One devil. Now, and I've, I've had considerable experience at this. Who had his dwelling among the tombs, no man could bind him, no, not with chains because that he had often been bound with fetters or shackles and chains, the chains had been plucked asunder by him and the shackles broken in pieces. Neither could any man tame him. Well, he had an unclean spirit. He was possessed with this thing. Always, night and day, he was in the mountains, in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. He was a cutter and he didn't sleep night and day. So you could imagine what kind of condition he was in. He's naked. Well, that devil is in him, controlling him. Now, everybody heard this. Everybody that was there heard this. Well, if there wasn't anybody there but his men, they heard every bit of this. They were right there with him. So now notice this. He had an unclean spirit, one. So he was an unclean man. Living among those tombs, no man could bind him. When he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshiped him. Now, if there had been anybody that the devil could have stopped from worshiping, it would have been him because he completely controlled him. Come on. But he worshiped him. He couldn't stop him from worshiping him. And I will point out that Jesus delivered him, 
just like that. Amen. 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 So now notice this. And, and I'm going to attempt to do this. You, it's, it's, it's hard to imitate this, but I've had devils to talk to me more than once. And cried with a loud voice, What am I to do with thee, Jesus, son of the most high God? I adjure you by God, you torment me not. For Jesus had already said to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is your name? He answered and said, My name is Legion, for we are many. My name is Legion, for we are many. So there's three to 6,000 devils involved in this thing. I have no earthly idea how he first yielded to it. I don't know. But now he's, it's completely done in him. And he besought him much that he would not send them away out of that country. They were there on assignment. Now, there were 2,000 hogs or more. They were food for the Roman army. There sure weren't any Jews having anything to do with them. <laughs> but that's what frightened the people there. Mm -hmm. So now, now there were nigh under the mountains a great herd of swine feeding, and then all the devils. Now the people didn't hear this, but Jesus did. They didn't hear this. Send us into the swine that we may enter into them. Forthwith Jesus gave them leave. The unclean spirits went out, entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea, and they were drowned, about 2,000 of them. All spirit beings desire a body. Those devils lost their bodies. Fallen spirits. They're fallen devils. I wish I had time to go into all that, but I don't. But every spirit desires a physical body through which they have a wide range of expression. The Holy Spirit needed your and my body to have a wider range of expression. Amen. I had the Lord say to me one time, this is Memphis, Tennessee. And the uh, first meeting I was on with Brother Roberts, this was the second time my feet stuck to the ground. I walked in there, and there's over 2,000 sick people in there, and I could smell it. It frightened me so, I just walked out the exit door <laughs> in that big auditorium in Memphis. And I got out the door, and my feet stuck to the sidewalk. And I said, all right, what is it? He said, on here inside here, he said, where are you going? I said, I'm going home. I said, I'm going back to Tulsa. How are you going to get there? I said, I don't know. I'm going to catch a Greyhound bus or something. They can get that airplane home any way they want to. <laughs> Why? I said, I, I, I can't stand that. Mm. He said, inside me, he said, Kenneth, I could have filled you with an angel. I was standing right out there on that sidewalk. I'm talking out loud. I'm just glad there wasn't anybody walking along there. <laughs> I said, you could what? 
He said, well, what do you think a demon-possessed man is? Full of a fallen angel, the devil himself. I said, my feet are still stuck now. Because in a minute, he's going to give me my choice. He said, I didn't fill you with an angel. I wouldn't trust you to an angel. I filled you with myself, and I have anointed you to do something about this. Now, what are you going to do? And my feet came unstuck. And I said, praise God, I'm going back in there. <laughs> and I found out right then, that's why I'd been baptized in the Holy Ghost. Up to then, I knew I was speaking a lot of tongues real hard and fast, but I didn't know, I mean, you know what, what, I mean, what's it all about? It's great, you know, and all that. But now I found out why. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, now this is happening to this man. Jesus gave them leave and the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea and they were about 2,000 and they drowned. And they that fed the swine fled and told it in the city and in the country they went out to see what was done. They come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind and they were afraid. Where did they get the clothes? Faith prepares. He knew what he was going to do, and he knew he's going to call this man to preach. He's clothed and in his right mind, and they began to pray him to get out of here. And when he was come into the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. How be it Jesus suffered him not, but said, Go home to your friends and tell them how great things the, the Lord hath done and has had compassion on you. And he departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him, and all men did marvel. Now check it out. Check it out. The next time Jesus came through Decapolis, the crowd was there. It just didn't give us his name. So, here's what must have happened. Jesus must have said, Terry, he must have said, now look, before we go over there, I want to warn you about something. There's a man over there and he's completely com possessed with the devil and he's going to be nasty looking. He's going to be running around out there naked and he's a cutter. He, he's going to be bleeding. Looks terrible, nasty. But my father has directed me to go over there and deliver him of that devil because my father wants to call him to preach. So Judas, come up with some money here. Go buy some nice clothes. Now, I don't want him going home naked. No. The man's going to be a preacher. He needs to look good. He needs to go home looking good. And they're going to say, where in the world are you being? Well, let me tell you. So then he would have gone all the way back and told his story then of how it got started. Now, I was in Jamaica, and uh, we were headed to church one night, and the man that was driving for me, he said, he said, Brother Copeland, he said, before, before we, go, before we go, go, go preach in New Hope, he said, can we stop by and pray, and pray for a woman? I said, sure. And he started to get in the car, and he said, oh, yeah, she's mad. I said, why? She said, she's crazy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I had a former Marine with me, and he was helping me in, in a lot of different ways. Well, there was Earl and the pastor and me. So we went into this house, no electricity, just you know, oil lamps. We were up in the mountains. That's what the Lord directed me to do. 
And uh, got up there and walked into this house and we walked in there. It looked like, looked like some kind of Halloween thing. It was spooky. I mean, we went through a couple of rooms and it looked like to me anybody in there could have qualified. I mean, it was a bad looking place. And they kind of laughing at me as I walked by. And some of them, I was the first light-skinned man they'd ever seen in the first place. I'm up in the hills, walked all the way back, and there was a young woman up in the middle of a bed. No, no just, just no cotton mattress. Just squatted on a the haunches there. No kerosene lantern hanging on the wall or light, you know, globe over it. And it wasn't a lantern, but it was a wall light. So it's kind of dim in there in the first place. I walked up there and, and she was just like this. If, if, if that's me standing there, she was about like this. And when we walked in there, she turned around and she ducked down like this. She looked over there at that pastor and he said, you must be Oral Roberts. He said, no, ma'am. Looked over there at Earl and said, you must be Brother Weber. Well, Brother Weber was a, a, a radio teacher and a good one. He said, no, ma'am. I know who you are and you're afraid of anything that isn't flesh and blood. I looked at, and he went down, I said, now look at me, baby, look at, look at me. I, I said, I fear neither man nor beast. Look at me. Now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, whose I am and whom I serve, you let her go. You come out of her right now and she ducked her head, and I said, no, now listen to me. The Lord Jesus, the Lord Jesus sent me here to tell you that he loves you. She ducked, and I said, look, 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 look at me. She looked up there at me. I said, the Lord sent me here to tell you that he loves you. Well, I didn't have time to hang around. She just looked at me. You could see it in her eyes that spirit was gone. Well, we got in the car and I asked the pastor, I said, do you know this family? Oh yeah. He said, I've, I've known, I've known. The whole. I said, what happened to her? Well, brother Kenneth, he said she was 18 years old and she was, she was a waitress and there was a group came to town and preaching and she got saved and she was so thrilled. So she bought her a new dress and she went and had her hair fixed and, and cleaned up and, you know, and, you know, powdered up and everything and went to church. And she walked up on the front door of the church and they said, you can't come in here. Why? You have cut your hair. Look, what's that on your fingernails? Jesus does not love women that cut their hair, paint their face, and paint their fingernails. They wouldn't let her in the church. Jesus. Well, she didn't know anything. And, and she, she tried her best to keep working, but she got that on her mind and she couldn't get it off, didn't know how to get it off, and nobody up there in those hills could tell her anything. Well, the pastor really didn't know how to handle it. And she dwelt on it and dwelt on it and dwelt on it and dwelt on it until that devil took over her mind. He didn't take over her spirit. She's born again. I didn't know. I kept telling her that Jesus sent me to tell her he loved her. And that's what snapped it and that thing left. Hallelujah. This is what this is all about. Well, now, this is the very beginning. Well, I was living there. The glory and I was living in that, that little place there in Tulsa. Mm -hmm. Well, our house faced this way, and there were houses facing this way, 
And then across the back alley, there are another house. And so our good friends lived in one of those houses there. And he was going to um, Trinity Bible College there in Tulsa. <laughs> Charles Duncombe started that school. And he had Smith Wigglesworth preach in his church. Oh, and he told a story. I wish I had time to tell you. But anyway, <laughs> oh, Lord. Well, let me back up. Something that happened before that. I was preaching. I was just singing. Had a meeting with Charles Rogers. Oh, what a man of God. Well, he was, he was doing the preaching. I was just there to sing. And I was having a great time. Well, this woman said, Brother Roger, Rogers, would you go to the hospital with me? She said, my mother's about to die, and I don't know whether she's saved or not. Would you come? He said, well, sure. So he said, come on, you can go. So I just went. Well, got there. <laughs> Well, I stopped down here at the foot of the bed because I don't know anything about this. And this little old woman is laying there like this. She looked like she's about 75. Mouth kind of hung open. Well, Charles and the girl were up there talking together. <laughs> and while they're talking, this little bitty woman raised straight up in the bed and said, sick boy, sick, sick boy, sick. Scared me. I'm telling you, I ran out that hospital door. I was standing out there in that hall and I said, oh Lord, what on earth was that? Oh, and then I was so ashamed of myself. Back in those days, I weighed about 220. And I said, look at my big ugly self. That devil run me out of the room, and I guarantee you there'll never be another to run me out. <laughs> well, and so the day we left to go to Tulsa, the Lord said, you get that fat off of you today. <laughs> well, I trimmed down considerably by this time. So John called me. He said, can you come over here and help me? He said, there's a young man that's staying in my house and he said, I think he's got a devil in him. He said, I can't get him to leave. <laughs> so I went over there. I said, what's the matter here? He said, well, he gave his testimony at the Full Gospel Business Men's Fellowship. And, and he was a tail gunner on a B-25 in World War II. And everybody was killed but him. I said, is that what he told over there? Yeah. Did they believe it? <laughs> well, yeah, he came to stay home. I said, he wasn't even born in World War II. I mean, come on. <laughs> Really? <laughs> uh, he don't know what a B-25 is. <laughs> I said, yeah, I'll come over. <laughs> so I walked into John's kitchen, and there the guy sat there in that kitchen, at the kitchen table. Well, the, the table was just a little dinette table, you know, chair here and a chair here. He was sitting here, so I came over here and said, I'm talking to him. Now, there's a hall, a door right there going into the hall. It was just like our house. And you turned that way for one bedroom and that way for another bedroom. Well, John, I don't know where Joanne was, but he was standing there in the hall. So I sat there and was looking at him across that table. I could see it in his eyes. And uh, I just gave him some scripture and he wouldn't answer me, wouldn't say anything. Just his eyes were just dead. And I did my best with scripture, so he just wouldn't, wouldn't respond at all. So I said, well, I'm going to pray for you. And I stood up and I got him to stand up and turned him around here this way. In the name of Jesus, and I put my hand on his head and he hit me in the face. Mm -mm. <laughs> I just reacted. I didn't think. I unloaded on him. I hit him so hard, it knocked him back through that hall and stuck his rear end through the sheetrock wall, and he's hanging out that hole like this. I caught him like this, pulled him out of that hole, 
and set him down and sat down on him and started casting devils out of him. <laughs> and by the time I got through with him, he was all right. Now, I do not recommend that. that kind of <laughs> but anyway, I mean, that, that's just the way it happened. And, he, and so John was running around that ring in his hand. He said, what's the landlord going to say about this hole in my wall? He didn't care enough about that. <laughs> don't do that. You know how you keep from doing that? You don't touch him. You get eye contact. And don't lose it. There was a young woman this, I, I remember this as being in England. I, I believe it was. Anyway, she came up there in front of me, just really nice looking, and said she had some, some problems, wanted deliverance from him. I said, all right. So, you know, we began to pray. I didn't detect any problems. And so... I laid hands on her and she spit in my face. I mean, just spit. And I started laughing. And I started laughing and I laughed and I laughed and I laughed. She's standing there looking at me like this. Just, I mean, the devil all over. And I laughed and I laughed and I laughed. I said, come get her and take her back there in that room and get the devil out of her. And they did. And she came out. She was just happy. And I just had spit running down all over my face. <laughs> Don't ever be afraid of them. Right. Not ever. Amen. Not yeah. ever. Yes. But you listen in Amen. Amen. What do you think? You get anything out of this tonight? Amen. Faith works. Amen. And the, the basic fundamentals of faith. Brother Hagin would say it over and over and over and over again. Now, now be careful because you'll start where you are and then you'll have new people come in and they don't have any idea what you're talking about. Right. He said from time to time, I mean, go to the, to the fundamentals of faith, the basic fundamentals. The a, he'd call it the ABCs of faith. Amen. So you go back to the woman with the issue of blood and you start over again. Now, this is the way faith works. Amen. Number one, <laughs> faith is a product of the spirit, not the mind. Amen. It's born out of and in the born again human spirit. We were in a seminar one Sunday afternoon and Brother Hagin finished up his, what he was saying and got over there in, in, in Thess Thessalonians and he said, I pray God, your whole spirit and soul and body. I turned to Gloria. I said, that is the key right there. That is it. The soul and the spirit are not the same thing. Yes. And you go to the book of Hebrews and it says it again. Dividing the soul and the spirit with the word. That's it. We are spirit beings and our words are filled with either faith or something else. And I'll say it to you again. Let me get up there so I can quit. I'll say it to you again while you stand up. In fact, you can say it with me. And say it boldly. Faith filled words, words dominate, dominate the, laws the laws of sin and death. Sin and death. I'm, a I'm a believer. I am a spirit being like God. I, am a being like God. I, speak, I speak like God. Like God. 
I speak His words. I speak his words. And His words, and his words become, my words, become my words. And then my Father God and me are one. We are one together. We are one spirit together. I love the Lord my God with all my heart, all my mind, all my soul, and all my strength. I love my neighbor as myself, fulfilling all the law and the prophets. And Jesus said, I give you a new commandment that you love one another. And all people will know you're my disciples the way you love one another. So rejoice and be glad for I have developed a way to see to it that you're always well all the time. Now, I'm going to say this. It has come up in my spirit. You may have taken the COVID vaccine. Now, that vaccine is experimental. And you may be having some reaction from it. Well, that thing is subject to the healing power. God just seems anything else. Yes, amen. Praise God. You know why? Because it's in there mixing with your blood. And your blood's mixed with the blood of Jesus. And you won't, you, I, I'm just saying this. I'm just saying this. I'm just saying this. If you think that's something to that, you just start taking communion every day. Every day, every day, every day. You just take communion every morning and every night before you go to bed. As often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. And then every time you do it, start remembering things that he's done in your life, times that he's healed you, times you've seen miracles, amen, and just keep going straight on and say, well, glory to God. I don't know if I could get it back. Maybe it would, but it's in there. Glory to God, and it's subject to change. It is subject to the word of the living God. It is subject to my faith, and I'm healed and well. And I'll not give that thing any credit. The president of the United States took those things, and he got it. Well, he had a much milder case. I don't want any case of it at all. I don't care how it's mild or not. So I'm not criticizing him. It's my job to pray for him. The man needs prayer. And, and I, I, I pray, first of all, what Jesus prayed. I said, Lord, send laborers across his path with the word of his salvation and the word of his healing. Praise. I mean, get this man saved. Oh, I, well, see, I, I don't personally know him. I don't know him, anything about him. But he's the only president I have right now. And I'm obligated to pray for him. I'm not obligated to like his politics. But that's his business. My politics are my business. Amen. Amen. Glory to, God. Glory to God. Pray for him. Amen. Hold him up before God. Thank God for him. He's in that office. And you've been seeing things. He says things kind of off the cuff and it starts something in motion. I, I, I really don't think it's really, he's been vice president. But I don't think he's really realized that everything he says is a matter of record. And once he said it, it is out there. So, and you look at Taiwan and, and all that, but that's not my place to criticize him. I'm not criticizing for, for taking that vaccine or the booster. I am praying for his healing. But that rose up on the inside of me that and it, it, it may be connected with something's bothering you. I don't know. I just heard it in my, in my spirit. Amen. 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 
Now, I can tell you this, because I did hear this in my spirit. Go after it. Go after it like you had COVID. Get in the healing scriptures. And may I tell you something else? You get some vitamin C capsules, a thousand cc's or one gram capsules. And the first thing when you get out of bed in the morning, I mean, you reach over there and you get a couple of those and you take them. And right before you go to bed at night, I mean, you get another couple of them and you take that. And if you do have symptoms, you start taking them five at a time. And you start, when you go to bed at night, you start taking those things and you make sure you take them and you take a fistful of them. They won't hurt you. But you just take those things and take those things and take those things till you get some movement and it'll go away. And you'll leave that COVID in the restroom. <laughs> I mean it. I mean it. I mean, my mama done that for me over and over when I was a boy. We didn't put up with symptoms in our house. Get that vitamin C. I got sick while I was in basic training and I snuck out at night and went to a payphone and called her. She said, what's the matter with you? I said, I don't know, Mama, I got a lot of fever. She said, is there any place around there that, that you can get any aspirins? I said, yeah, I'm right here in front of the dispensary. She said, can, can you get any vitamin C? I said, well, I don't, I don't know how. She said, you go in there and get you some aspirins. You start drinking extra orange juice every day. And she said, will they give you all you want? I said, yeah. She said, don't drink anything else. You start drinking that orange juice, forget the coffee, forget anything else. You load up on that orange juice. I went in there and I told that the guy behind the desk there, I told him where my unit was. And I said, I've got some fever, I need some aspirin. He just reached in there and got a box full of them and threw them at me. So I started taking them. And the next morning, breakfast, I went in there and got extra orange juice, extra orange juice, didn't drink anything, extra orange juice, extra orange juice. By noon, I was all right. I was all right. Now, <laughs> we were on bivouac out there in the middle of the desert and I got to coughing. So I got up and they had a dispensary tent around there and I said, man, I, <laughs> that, this is really hacking. So he just handed me this bottle and he said, just take a sip of that or something. I smelled of it. And it, it, I, had, I had smelled and took a sip of gin one time. I hated, I, I, anyway. <laughs> and I smelled of that. And I took a sip of it and it went down real easy. And, it, and I said, ah, you know, that's pretty good. He said, what is that? I said, what is it? Call, sir. Let me see that. He said, where'd you get that? I said, I got it at the dispensary. He said, <coughs> <coughs> He headed off down there and got him a bottle. <laughs> and somebody said, what is that? And he said, he said <coughs> so here he went. Well, they've been through that. They know it. They just let them do it. Just let them do it. The next morning, they paid for it. They drank nearly that whole bottle of that. And now they're like this. And boy, I want you to know, 4.30 comes really early out there in the desert. <laughs> Get your what do you know out of that tent? <laughs> oh, please, please, please don't do that. Please don't do that. You. <laughs> so this guy in front of me was like this. I had to hold him by his belt loop to keep him straight. He won't fall over. And I'm just laughing. I don't have any cough, and I'm sober as I can be. <laughs> so, but that's the way you handle these things. Amen. Not like that. But you don't go, you just, you, you don't just rush right down to the hospital and get another shot because you don't know what was in that one. Get hold of that vitamin C. If you can get to a sauna, go get in it. 
get you some Vic salve <laughs> and do just what your mama did. Rub it all over you, nasty and all. Get in that sauna and you'll come out of there well. Because all you have to do is get that stuff out of your body. That man right over there, Glenn Hyde, absolute wonderful friend of mine, flown airplanes with him. He checked me out in a 450 Stearman and then a, a, a T-28. <laughs> he, and I, back when he was 18, 19 years old, he was in the ag business, flying sprayers and all of that. Well, it left that, went to the Marine Corps, flew in the Marine Corps and all that, got a real good sauna and got in it. And you holler at me, Glenn, if I'm telling this wrong. That old stuff started sweating out of his pores and he began to smell like that old spray. Isn't that right? Old DDT. <laughs> they won't even let him use that stuff anymore but it was in his body and it had to be sweated out of there. The Indians knew this all the time. They'd build a little hut, start a fire, get stones hot and get in there and sweat and just smell bad and all that and just stay in there until the sickness left. They didn't know what else to do. And if I don't shut up, you're never gonna get to go home. <laughs> Come on, guys. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Are you ready? We are. Are you ready? We are. Are you ready?